Father, we do thank you for the wonderful grace that you demonstrated by sending your son to this dirty, filthy earth to take upon the role of a servant, a servant who would be killed not for his transgression, but for ours. And so, Lord, we thank you for Jesus, and we thank you also for the Holy Spirit who would come and move in us, regenerating our hearts, causing us to understand fully the truth of Christ and Him crucified and resurrected, and granting us repentance and faith. Lord, we give you all the glory for what you've done in our hearts, give you all the glory for what you've done in this church, among these people. We do pray for those who don't know you. We pray for those who are here with us today or perhaps watching. We pray that you would give them the grace they need to turn to you once and for all and have genuine faith. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, it is great to be back with you. So thankful for Pastor Terry. I was so encouraged by his message last week. I've heard nothing but great comments. We have a bit of chaos the ensuing weeks, as a lot of you do. This is sort of the busy time of year. A lot of coming and going, people here and gone, and uh, of course in this time we're going to be welcoming our family minister, Spencer Reevely, very excited to have them with us very soon. If you would please open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, so used to saying Matthew, (laughs) Mark chapter 4, we're going to look at just a few sentences there in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 29, four sentences, it's Jesus' parable of the sower. The parable of the sower, not to be confused with the parable of the soils, this is the parable of the sower. Last time we are together, we completed our five-year study of Matthew with Jesus answered the question, now what? What we discovered is that the core task of a disciple is making disciples. It's obedience to those simple words of Jesus to go and tell, to make disciples. That's the command, consistent with all the other words of Jesus. After His resurrection, again, He said over and over again, go and tell, go and tell. But their job, we learned, is not simply to procure converts. They're not simple gospel salesmen trying to get people to say some words or pray a prayer as quickly as possible. Rather, it's a much more comprehensive job, and that is to make disciples disciples. So I thought it would be good, in fact, I think it's necessary to periodically remind ourselves of this truth and the task that Jesus has given us to make disciples. A simple command, a simple imperative to obey, and yet, like I said last time, so often it is ignored or even disobeyed. Again, that means the core task of a disciple maker is simply obedience. Today, what I'd like to address is the core attitude of the disciple maker, and that is the attitude of trust, the attitude of trust. By the time we get to this parable in Mark, Jesus had given His followers uh, messages about the kingdom, some parables about the kingdom, and what they learned is that how God's sovereignty would be affected, would take place, is through the message, through the plan of the followers of the Messiah taking the message of the gospel to the world. How's God going to save all, each and every last of His lost sheep? How's He going to bring these lost sheep to Himself? He's going to send out sheep who had been saved. And those sheep would take the message of Jesus, the Word of Christ crucified and resurrected. And then God would take that Word, He'll plant it in the hearts of His lost sheep, that Word will then, by the Spirit, regenerate their souls. They'd be awakened to the truth of the gospel. They'd be regenerated. And after that regeneration, they'd be compelled to have faith and the according repentance, trusting in what Christ had done. Well, for us to do this, for us to take on this task, we must have this particular attitude, the attitude of trust. It is indeed, like I said, the core attitude of disciple makers, all of us who are striving to obey Jesus. All right, your Bibles are open. Let me read to you the text, Mark 4, 26 to 29. Read this short parable. 
and then we'll take some time to study it. Speaking of Jesus, it says, and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. If you have been with us very long, you know that though our church has events and programs, we have schedules and systems and roles and organization, we are nevertheless decidedly not a program-driven church. That's not to say we're anti-program or that we're against programs. We indeed have them. And that's also not to say that people can't be touched through programs and events and ministries. I myself was saved in a, a giant evangelistic event that was taking place in the summer of 1989. But the striking difference between the modern church and the ancient church is that in the modern church there is a preponderance of programs And in the ancient church, there is the utter lack of them. You can't read the New Testament and find a children's program for the church. You can't read the New Testament and find out they had some sort of Tuesday night evangelism program, no discipleship program, no conferences in the church, believe it or not, no even outreach events. There's none of this going on in the New Testament. Now, that is, again, not to say they didn't teach their children or they didn't obey Jesus' great commission In fact, I think they did it better than we do. And it's not to say that we can't do these things or it's sinful to organize ourselves or have a conference or schedule something or have some sort of program. It is simply to say in terms of our church and our identity and what we're going to be like is to be as close to that New Testament church as possible, which is to not highlight the importance or the value of programs. We do it as an accident not something that is part of who we are. Now, outside of the fact that we don't see programs in Scripture, there are other reasons to resist the urge to emphasize church programs and events. One, statistics show us, proven really beyond any question, though many people have come into Christianity, the the movement of Christianity through great events and programs, most of the people, by far, most of the people who come to the church, who come to Christianity by events and programs, do not stay. When I was in seminary, I remember there was a statistic given to us by the Billy Graham Association. I don't know if they hand this out very freely or if they even hand this out anymore, but they said only about 1% of the people who come down and make a decision for Christ actually stay in a church. People who come to Christ in these events, these giant events, these giant programs don't stay there. On the other hand, statistics have proven, have demonstrated that people who come to Christ simply through relationships, through organic relationships, you just discipling your child or you just making a disciple of your neighbor or your coworker, almost 90% of those people come to church and stay in church. It's just far more effective to just simply make disciples as they did in the New Testament. I've seen this so many times. A program is well executed. It brings all these people into the church, only to find out many of them fall away, never to come again. I've also seen the other thing, the very positive thing, where someone simply is intent on making their neighbor or their friend or their coworker or a family member a disciple, and they work, they do the hard work for years working with them and discipling them, and they make a very effective, faithful disciple. Well, I say all this not to denigrate our programs. We do have programs in the church. I say it not to denigrate any kind of program we have to get together and reach people with the gospel. I say that not to denigrate even our prayer meetings or any kind of organization that we have, but I say that because it is my dream, it is my hope, it's my prayer for our church 
is that we would be a church that organically, naturally makes disciples as we go about life. I pray for what Pastor Mark Dever calls the culture of evangelism to predominate our church rather than some program or event. Well, this series of sermons, the next few times we're together, I want to take these times to stir up our efforts to just put that into our DNA, to make it who we are. Not by way of program, though, not against programs, but just by way of culture, by way of attitude, by way of personality, that it just becomes a natural part of your life. I'm praying that we all become just naturally organic disciple-makers. All right, let's turn to the text. Let me give you a little context of what's happening here in Mark 4, just some some things uh, that we can know about this passage. We've not been going through Mark 4, so a little context is needed. So let me do that first, and then I want to make some points after that. In the first place, just sort of as an aside here, this is the only time this parable is mentioned. It's kind of unique. It is unique to Mark. And it's, it's uh, kind of a beautiful thing that this is the only place we find this. You can look at Matthew and Luke, the rest of the Bible, you won't find this parable. For whatever reason, Mark, perhaps in his uh, sort of urgent way in which he writes his gospel, is conveying to his readers the urgency of evangelism, the urgency of this task. And he includes this idea of this attitude that we should have as disciple makers. Something else we want to know about this passage that it gives us really an undiluted description of how God's kingdom will grow, of how the gospel is going to go forth. We can filter out all the polls and all what's reported or surveyed today and fed to us as, as what is successful in building up churches. These are the kingdom parables, and Jesus is teaching His disciples how the kingdom will go forth, how the kingdom will grow you remember the kingdom parables, the, the parallel text, Matthew chapter 13, the kingdom parables, one of the parables talks about this mustard tree that sm- starts very small and that grows giant so that all the nations really come and make their nest. These kingdom parables talk about the growth of the kingdom. So the first two parables here in Mark 4 have to do with the fact that, A, the first parable talks about Jesus' kingdom, essentially that it's a spiritual kingdom. It deals in souls. It deals with people's hearts. And then we learn in that second parable here in Mark 4 that God is going to use humans, other sheep, other disciples, to bring people into the kingdom. So a unique thing about this parable before we get into dissecting it, is that we can strip away all the things that talk about how the kingdom grows, how churches grow, the marketing techniques, the polls, all the science that goes into so much of modern church. We can just strip it away to this very simple idea. God inspires His sheep to go find the lost sheep, to tell them the gospel. And using the power of the gospel through the power of the Spirit, He regenerates their hearts and brings them into the kingdom. Again, no program here, no strategy, no marketing. It's just simply believers going and telling people the gospel. Some years ago, before I moved to Hawaii, I found great joy in a hobby, the hobby of collecting books. At one point, I had about 4,000 books in my library. In fact, it was so many books that uh, the people at my church decided I needed to have a dedicated library, and they cut a hole in my office wall into another office and turned that office into just bookshelves. And I had these thousands of books, and I was constantly acquiring a new set or a new ancient book or something that I wanted to look at and maybe read. Somewhere along the way, I got convicted, this expensive hobby, and I decided to start offloading my books. The first and easiest section of books for me to offload were the church growth books. I went over to a section. There were several hundred books there. I began to look at the titles of these books, How to Grow Your Church in 90 Days, The Church Growth Spiral, The Older One Flakes Formula for Sunday School Growth, The Purpose Driven Church, 
how to revitalize the Sunday morning dinosaur. I sat there looking at those books, and I looked at them. I realized how completely irrelevant most of them were. They were old marketing techniques just incorporated into the church. And whether that book was written in 1996 or 1986 or 2006, I remember looking at all these books and realizing how irrelevant and stupid most of these books were. Each one of these books, most of them had a, a time in the light where there was some pastor of some giant church that told, the, told everybody how he made his church big and he systematized it, turned it into a program, wrote a book about it. Thousands of people would gather to learn how this man made his church so big and we would all follow and buy the study guide and buy the teacher's guide and follow along. I remembered with a bit of shame as I looked at those books how several times I did that. She got enamored by the idea of having a big church and following these plans and these marketing techniques. After looking at all those books, I went over to the janitor's closet and I got this giant tub, rolled it over to in front of those books and I threw them all in the tub and I took them up to the dumpster and threw them away. You say, what a waste. Not a waste. Did the world a favor by getting rid of those stupid books. What turned me off most is the fact that without saying it, most of these books subtly taught that Scripture and the understanding of Scripture and simply obeying Scripture is not sufficient. It's somehow insufficient. One must devise a business model on top of whatever you see in the Bible. You must have a very complicated and very modern business model for your church to grow and therefore for the kingdom to grow. An individual simply wanting to make a disciple of their friend or coworker may be good, and we can sort of pat you on the head. Really what needs to happen is for churches to have all these exotic marketing techniques and technology to carry out some sort of plan. That's where the real numbers come. And that's really the mentality of the whole church growth movement beginning back in the 1950s, this idea We've got to take all the latest marketing techniques, inject them, inject them in the church, and by build, growing the church, your individual church, that's how the kingdom grows. That's how we get more and more people into the kingdom. Well, how's this worked so far for us? We've been in the church growth movement now 60, 70 years. We have more Americans or less Americans as Christians? Far less. Yeah, way more mega churches and giga churches out there, right? We have Lots of pastors who lead tens of thousands of people uh, uh, managing multi-million dollar budgets. But that's not done anything about the kingdom. Not because God didn't say that's how the kingdom will grow. The kingdom grows simply by us obeying organically Jesus' command to make disciples. And what is so great about this passage, it, it re-centers us on what is true. And how this happened it anchors us in the biblical, divine, infallible, simple truth of spreading the seed of the gospel to the people we know. Let me tell you another thing that's beautiful about this passage before we jump in. It is indeed a relief and consolation. We'll get to this more later on. But just reading this, this gives us such relief that it's not our job to build the kingdom. I'll tell you this, this is, this is true especially, I think, for pastors. Pastors have this pressure. I'm supposed to make my church bigger. I'm supposed to be looking at a bigger budget every year. I'm supposed to have more people in the pews. I'm supposed to build this thing or else I'm going to be looked down upon. People won't think I'm a good businessman. I'm not running the church well. I'm not effective. To find out that we're just supposed to obey by trying to make disciples and leave the growth up to God this individual scatters a seed, and then what does he do? He sleeps. He sleeps. I learned that the hard way that more hours at the church office, more hours in the hospitals and finance meetings, planning, executing, marketing as a pastor does not amount to greater faithfulness and does not amount to a better church. 
This passage also gives us great motivation to tell, teach others the gospel. It's one of the great motivations of evangelism. Why? Because it goes on to talk about the harvest. There is a harvest. We're not told how long or how much or what that harvest exactly will look like, but there is a harvest. Jesus would tell His disciples that the, the fields are white unto harvest. John chapter 4, do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes. See that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may, be, may rejoice together. He is saying, get involved in sowing and you'll enjoy reaping. You'll enjoy the harvest, even harvest you may have nothing to do with. One more thing about this passage before we jump in, just at a cursory glance, this passage gives God all the glory, right? It says nothing about the skill of the sower, how he walked, the pacing, the way he put his hand in the bag and pulled out the seed, how much seed he put in each hand or to toss. It did not, does not analyze at all the, his skill. It has to do with the miracle of the new birth. And the only person that's responsible for the miracle of new birth is God. This man is sleeping all the while. God does His work. All right, three things about this passage, three things that really illustrate for us this core attitude about evangelism. If the core task is obedience to the Great Commission, we might get a little bit legalistic about it. We might think that it's our efforts, our abilities that grow the kingdom. And so Jesus adds this wonderfully freeing parable, and it teaches us this core attitude of trust. What does this trust look like? First of all, number one, rest in the Word of God. Rest in the Word of God. Verse 26, he says, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. You say, well, that doesn't tell us too much. Well, context helps us a little bit. Thinking again through these kingdom parables Jesus had given, He had already told us about uh, sower and some soils, and we're told in verse 14 that the sower sows the Word. So, so the seed here, the analogy is the Word of God. That first parable, parable of soils, it's, it, soils, is the template for the rest of these kingdom parables. So when Jesus talks about sowing the seed, we already understand what He's doing. He's spreading the Word of God. It's the Word of God that delivers to us the message of salvation. We call that the gospel, the great news. The time when Christ was speaking, it was just coming into fulfillment. But the Word of God brings to us the message of the gospel, namely that every person is born dead, in need of redemption, in need of a Savior, and that Savior has indeed arrived, Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect life and laid down His life for us. So that all who would believe in Him would have their sins covered, atoned for, and they would be granted new life. This great news is in the Word of God. And this Word will change people forever. That's the seed. That's the Word. In reality, this parable is centered on the Word. If you were to pick a primary character, it's not really the sower, it's the Word and what the Word does. What does a seed do? Nevertheless, it does tell us a little bit about our work as sowers. After you think about what we're tasked with in taking the seed, you might be tempted, the disciples first hearing this might have been tempted to be a little bit discouraged. A couple of thoughts I wrote down that disciples might have been discouraged to know that they are the ones that are take the message, the, the seed, and, and scattered across the world for the growth of the kingdom. They might have been discouraged, first of all, thinking that they might be met with mostly rejection. You just look at that, that parable of the soils, right? There's four soils and three reject. Only one accepts the seed. And you think about this is true in life. It was true of Jesus. Jesus' ministry, uh, yes, at, at first it was big. There were thousands of people, huge crowds, but it got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until even as we saw at the cross, many, if not most of His followers were gone they were not even there. And maybe the disciples would, may have been a little bit discouraged that they heard that this is their job, they're going to scatter the seed, but they're going to be met with just loads of rejection, in fact, mostly rejection. 
which might have led them to a second temptation after hearing this. They might have thought, you know, what we need to do is we need to change the seed a little bit so that the, the ground will accept it. All these different types of ground, we're going to scatter the seed. Maybe we can, we can alter the seed a little bit so that all these different types of soils would receive the seed. Rather than bouncing off the ground, it would implant itself because it was something a little bit more acceptable. The second temptation, I think, is so common today. Maybe find the things about the gospel that are a little more, a little more appealing to the crowd. Maybe take the things that are a little bit embarrassing or disheartening about sin, about repentance, and maybe just filter those out and, and just focus on the positives. God loves you very much and He has a purpose for your life. Just tell Him that. Remember, I went to a, one of these churches that was growing in exponential ways, and I heard the preacher talk about Jesus' death on the cross, and I thought for sure he had an opportunity to talk about the atonement, he had an opportunity to talk about all the things that Christ accomplished and what his death does for us and our sin. Didn't mention sin once, he just had them all bow their heads and raise their hand if they feel lonely sometimes, and to repeat a prayer of thankfulness that God, in God you don't have to be lonely anymore. And then told them, well, now you're all Christians. You filter the gospel out of the gospel, all the things that make the gospel the gospel. It's not a gospel at all, as Paul would say in Galatians. He just filtered out all the offensive bits of the gospel, trying to make the seed something else. Well, this parable repels both of these temptations. It repels that first temptation. The sower sleeps, right? The picture is that he throws a seed, a number of days pass, and he's just not sequestered in his room, wringing his hands, worried about how he sowed it. He's not in his room in the fetal position wondering that I take long enough strides, that I get enough seed at the same time, that I scatter it in the right way, that I miss that portion or that portion. The picture that we get is the opposite. He is sleeping soundly. He's not worried. He sleeps. Why does he sleep? Because he has confidence, not in his ability, but in the power of that seed. Christian, I'm going to settle this for you forever. Every single time you present the gospel, it's filled with mistakes. And I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but every time I stand up here and preach from this pulpit, it's filled with mistakes. I hope not many. But there are plenty of mistakes. But the grace that we have is that the power is not in our ability to, to speak or to say things or to quote the verse perfectly. Our ability is really nothing. It's immaterial. The power is in the Word of God. The power is in the Word and the message of the gospel. And so our confidence is in the Word and the one who makes that Word alive in someone's heart. Well, that leads us to the fact that this repels that second temptation. The sower in no way attempts to make the seed more acceptable. He just grabs the seed and throws it on the ground. Don't ever buy that lie that you can make the word, the gospel, easier for people to swallow. The truth is, the gospel begins with this idea that we are fallen beings. We are dead in sin. And we need to hear truth about our deadness in sin. Therefore, when you sow the seed, you can't avoid this part of the gospel. In fact, it's not good news unless they first understand that they need good news, that they're lost. There's just this dominating idea, and much of it is in these, these great movements, these, this idea that you can minimize these things and just focus on the positive bits of the gospel and get, in people, get people into the kingdom. But the Bible story begins with Adam and Eve sinning, and you can't avoid that when you're sharing the truth. The objective is to give people the undiluted truth, even if that is sometimes difficult. Just think about the seed of God's Word, the power in that Word, just for a moment. Think about the Word of God, just that theme, the Word of God. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, it's a powerful thing, isn't it? God speaks, 
and the world suddenly exists. Think about the amount of power in His Word. God speaks, trees blossom all over the earth. God speaks, oceans are formed. It's amazing the power of God's Word. When you give someone simply the undiluted Word of God, the message of the gospel, all the elements of God's power are in that seed, that little seed. The power to convict of sin is in that seed. The power to understand the truth is in that seed. The power to repent is in that seed. The power to love God is in that seed. The power of passionate service is in that seed. A a spirit-filled life is in that seed. Godly parenting is in that seed. A good marriage is in that seed. A love for the lost is in that seed. When you give people the Word of God, you are giving them, you're introducing them to the power of God. The only seed that can actually be used by God, by the Spirit, to bring spiritual life. 2 Timothy chapter 3, we learn about this power and sufficiency of the Word. And Paul tells young Timothy, listen, Timothy, this is what will change your life. It will equip you for everything, every good work. It's right there in that seed, in the Word of God. And he goes on to explain to Timothy, that's why I want you to take that seed and give it to your people. Preach the Word of God to the people, undiluted. Don't lighten it. Don't avoid it. Don't find the easy parts of the Bible to preach. No, just preach the Word. In season and out of season. Even if they don't like it, preach the word. Why? Because that's the only power for salvation and sanctification. Then he goes on even further. Do the work of the evangelist. Take the word to others. It's the only power that would save them. Rest in the word of God. The sower is confident in the power of this seed. He knows that if he scatters a seed, the actual seed, he doesn't tamper with it. That seed has in it all that a person needs for life and for eternity. Now, when you rest in the Word of God, and I've used this word already many times, when you rest in the Word of God, it also means, number two, you're resting in the power of God. Rest in the power of God. Look there at verse 27 and 28 again. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. I love that phrase, he knows not how. You know that for all the astronomers and microbiologists, there's still a finite amount of information that humanity has. Despite all our equipment, all the brilliant minds for thousands of years our information is still limited, and scientists, even the most brilliant of scientists, at some point throw up their hands and say, I don't know. I don't know how that happens. It's why they have parts of the molecule called gluons. What is a gluon? It helps things stick together. They don't know how. Let's just call them gluons. That's the most brilliant minds coming up with things like that. They don't know how. If you start to look beyond what they can observe, what you find is a lot of philosophy. You find a lot of guesswork built on their own presuppositions, not built on anything but their guesses, but their worldviews. They're just sort of guessing what happens. The theory of evolution is really just a guess, and it's a guess by people who, frankly, want nothing to do with God. They build their whole theory around basically hating God. The scientists of this world can't explain it. No matter how amazing our equipment gets, no matter how brilliant the minds are, in the end, we just don't know. know. Backing up through the centuries, that's exactly where this sower was. He throws the seed down. He doesn't know how it works. He doesn't know what happens with that seed. He's not informed on all these things. And even if he were a microbiologist in the 21st century, he still wouldn't know everything. At some point, he would throw up his hands and say, I don't know. 
This guy doesn't know anything. He just throws a seed, and all he knows is at some point, little sprouts start to come up. He doesn't know how it all works. This is true about the gospel, isn't it? God tells us to spread the word. Sometimes you give the word to someone, and they seem so receptive only to find out that they're rejecting you. Sometimes you give the word to somebody, and they seem to reject it only to find out later that they've received Christ. And they loved the story of the gospel. We don't know how this works. How does it work? Well, it's the power of God. That's God's lane. That's His authority. We just sow and we trust the Lord to change people. We fire and forget. And we relish the joy of seeing people's lives changed by the power of God. And that's what God does. That's His business. By His Spirit, He changes lives. He changes their wills. He changes their hearts. The fact of the matter is, when you look even at your own salvation... You get to the point where you just say, I don't know how you did it. It's just amazing that you took me and you rose me up. You resurrected my spirit. And I'll say that my salvation is all of God. It's all of His power. His power has given me the faith I need to follow Christ in a repentant way. You see, if the focus here was on the skill of the sower... If it was on the expertise or the innovation or the relevance, we would be forced at some point to say, well, you know, I mean, we've got to give a little credit to the sower because he was just so skilled at what he did. He's a really good farmer. So we've got to give at least a little bit of credit to that farmer. Well, nowhere in this passage does this even hint in that direction. Earlier I talked about all the methods and books and programs and plans that speakers and strategies and all these things have pointed to through the years during the church growth era. Perhaps the thing that turns me off most is that it steals glory from God and gives it to man. In the end, people say, that's a brilliant strategy. That's an amazing thought, the way he organized that or the way that they did that. Or they had these goals and they had these, these wickets that they hit to reach these goals and before you know it, they had this giant church. So yes, we, we prayed and we give glory to God, but, but boy, that guy is really smart. We got to listen to him. You know, they had the, this problem in the Bible, the early church. They actually had this problem. Early in the church, there were people who were walking around, pounding their chest and say, well, I am of Apollos. Apollos led me to Christ. He really knows how to preach. He knows how to... And other people say, well, I'm a little better than you. I'm of Paul. Paul led me to Christ. And they began to worship, in essence, worship these men. What does Paul say? I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. In other words, we're nothing. Give us zero credit. Don't give me any credit. Don't give me any credit. One of the dangers of becoming sort of a programmatized church or buying into these things, one of the dangers is that people begin to create a sacred cow. Sometimes it's a man. Sometimes it's a program. Maybe that program did bring them into the kingdom. But instead of worshiping God and thanking God that he, God could have used any method, they begin to worship that sacred cow. And then they, they protect that sacred cow in the church with tooth and nail. They don't want anybody to touch that program, even if it's largely ineffective. No, we don't worship programs. We don't worship men. We worship God. These programs, the church building, the facilities, the organization, we are nothing. God is the one who builds this church. God is the one who affects His gospel in the hearts and brings life. We don't even know how it happens. He breathes life into the spirit of man. This passage is focused on God's Word and God's work. It's a mysterious power. And therefore, any success in evangelism, any success in the church is not of us. It is to God be the glory, great things He has done. One more thing, number three, relish the harvest of God. We have at the very end this beautiful, joyous last sentence, verse 29, but when the grain is ripe, at once He puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. You see, the work of the sower is limited. His effort is limited. His work is finite. 
The yoke that's placed on him to share the gospel, to spread the seed, is easy and light. He simply sows the seed, but then he gets to enjoy the harvest. And it's my experience that if you're faithful at sowing, God allows you to reap, sometimes even in places you haven't sown. I read part of John chapter 4, part of that passage. The end of that passage says this, I'm sending you to reap where you have not sown. In other words, you get the joy of just going and picking up this soul that I'm saving. I found that a church who faithfully sows the word is constantly reaping, sometimes reaping souls that we didn't even know about. Let me say something. If you don't sow, there will be no harvest. There will be no joy. This happens to many churches. They stop sowing the seed. They may be experts in drawing a crowd or procuring decisions. They may make their focus gaining attendance or executing big budgets, but they get their reward. On the other hand, those who focus genuinely on sowing the Word of God, we get to enjoy this wonderful harvest. Friends, even when this life is not great, even when things are going terribly for you, if you're faithfully sowing the seed, you get to have some joy of the harvest. Jesus told His disciples to go work in the harvest. They're white, He says. I read from John 4. There are people out there ready to hear and understand the gospel. I've prepared a way for you. Go work in the harvest. Reap where you haven't sown. And remember what He said in Matthew 9. He adds to this. Matthew 9, 9, verse 35, Jesus went throughout the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction. When He saw the crowds, He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And He said to His disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly that the Lord of the harvest, that He would send out laborers into His harvest. Now, this is a theme of my prayers for our church right now, that we would become co-laborers in the harvest of God. Praying this for all of you, that we would be laborers together in the harvest, that we would find joy, even as we talk with one another in our family groups and discuss our plans and our ideas and who we're trying to reach out to. This all begins with the attitude of trust. We want to obey. That's our action. Our attitude is an attitude of trust. When you sow the seed and you rest in the Word of God and in the power of God who works all things according to His plan, your rest is not just sleep. It's joy. It's cherishing. It's relishing the harvest that God is producing. Well, let's pray that we would all be faithful and join in reaping the harvest. Father, we thank You for today. We thank You for Your wonderful truths. We pray that we would indeed trust You. Really, that's what this is all about, trusting You, resting in You, believing in You, believing in Your Word and in Your power and in the harvest that You have for those who obey. We pray that we would all be obedient. Give us a desire to share truth with others. Give us faithfulness to share truth with others. Father, Father, I pray that we would not try to tamper with your truth, that we would give it as best we can and trust that you'll take our feeble attempts at re-presenting the gospel to others, Lord. You'll take those attempts and open up people's minds and hearts to the truth of your Son. Father, as always, we pray for those who don't know you. Open their minds even now and ask this in Jesus' name name. Amen. Stand with me, if you will. This benediction is inspired by Titus. Now may we go make disciples with the confidence and joy that God, by the Spirit and the Word, washes His children by regeneration to make His people heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Amen.